What we're talking about, the AB 101 veto right, how many folks in the room were at this? Excellent. Um, so it happened uh, 20 years ago in San Francisco, in particular at the state building, caused by uh, then Governor Pete Wilson's veto of a bill, Assembly Bill 101, that was preventing discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation that, as you saw in this clip, passed through the legislature. And in fact, Pete Wilson had uh, promised that he would sign it. Um, and part of what happened was that after it passed the legislature, the religious right in California, the Traditional Values Coalition, mobilized uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people to write in, and it changed Pete Wilson's mind, and um, he vetoed it. So that is sort of the context that set off all of these um, uh, riots. And uh, it's, I think, probably worth saying as well, to put this into context, that the national version of a non-discrimination bill has not yet been passed um, by Congress, nor signed by our president. Why was this the night that we arrived at? You know, we were angry all the time. <laughs> and, you know, and, and this, you know, we, this bill was certainly on our radar, but it was, you know, I, I doubt if we would have put it in our top five list of priorities if somebody had asked us to list them. I mean, the war had just happened and all those demos had just happened. It was the absolute height of people getting sick and dying. Um, you know, and there were so many other things going on, and, you know, I know there were people who study mob psychology and why crowds behave the way they do, and I, you know, sort of be interested in that aspect of it, but just from our perspective as a community, why was this the night that we broke things and things were lit on fire, and there was a chant that night which was gay rights or gay rights. And I had completely forgotten about that. Um, and I also remember that there was a... Does anyone remember the chant, Hey cops, just try it. Remember Stonewall was a riot? Um, you know, and we used to chant that to the cops all the time. Right? Um, and that was... Because there was always this thing where you're demonstrating, but you're also... But in, you know, demonstrating about whatever topic you're demonstrating, but police brutality was always part of what we were demonstrating against. Really. You know, and the relationship between... Cops and queers, you know, had this ugly history, and so that was always kind of bubbling there beneath the surface. But in a way, I don't know if this was a riot against the cops. It was really more a riot against the state building. You know, it didn't feel to me like it was about the police that night, particularly. Um, you know, and I just was remembering all the, you know, the the slow, the um, the posters that said a thousand points of light, and it was a Molotov cocktail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we love to use it. Violent people, and we always said we were nonviolent organizations, and this was not part of who we were. And you know, so it just kind of always made me think, like, why was this what went off? And so I'm not sure I have an answer exactly. I would love to hear when we get to the discussion part of the evening. I would love to hear people's thoughts about why they think this was the night that it went off the way it did. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to the audience. I know a number of you in the audience were there that night, and I'm wondering if anyone in the audience would like to share a story or two. Yes. Uh, my name's Eric Schwery, and that's actually me. I'm a little older now. <laughs> There was a, a, a kind of a, a seething anger in a lot of us for the way the government neglected the AIDS crisis in this country. And I was right there at the windows. I didn't break anything. Um, but uh, I saw a lot of people I knew breaking things, and, and I was cheering them on um, because it was a way of expressing that anger that, that was built up inside, and, and it was really a deep sense of betrayal. Great, thank you. Hey, Dennis. Yeah, Dennis Tompkins. Um, I was a reporter for the Bay Area Reporter at the time, and I, I covered the, uh, the, the riot. At, at one point, the police backed off the whole street between, um, let's see, what's that? Golden Gate between uh, Larkin, and, and Jar, Larkin and Hyde. Yeah. It was totally, uh, totally empty of police. They were on the side, they were, on the, they were watching from the sides, and they couldn't do anything. And that's when we saw people, uh, well known activists, um, we're not here tonight. I pick up barricades and, and jam them through the uh, jam them through the windows, and that's when a, a man named Alan Kalbrowski, who I believe was later arrested for it, um, torched through a torch.
torch a lit newspaper into the, the computer room, at the, uh, which was the room that had its windows broken. It went up in flames, and that was the first one. And that's when Guillermo Tello went around and started doing the recording. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. So anyway, yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Woody Noah Karras. Uh, I was in front of the window at that computer room, you know, with glass and, and you know, the, the fire going and stuff like that. And it was the first and I hope only time that I heard someone say to me, dude, your shirt's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> because I did not know that that's how close, you know, yeah. I, that, you know, the shit was happening. And, and my rage, my anger was just so, you know, palpable. I, it, not, like, I didn't even notice that I was on fire. I mean, it wasn't, you know, a big fire, but, uh, you know, to be that focused on, you know, directing my anger, you know, elsewhere to not notice, you know, you know, something like that. I remember standing at the front door, and this guy had pulled a street sign, parking, I don't know what it was, out of the ground. And he had it up on his shoulder as a barricade, I mean, as a barricade basher, as a battering guy. I, I really enjoyed seeing the barricades taken and used as ladders up the side of the window <laughs> to get into the higher windows. That was cool. And I, I was one of the people that went up the ladders. Oh, you were one? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, there was quite a few of us, actually. I remember someone standing in the office doing something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and what I was going to say about it is, the building didn't burn to the ground. It wasn't for lack of trying. Yeah. <laughs> so, the people who went into the office were doing their darndest to, to set everything on fire that they possibly could. You know, it's a modern concrete and steel. It wasn't actually, it was pretty hard to set that thing on fire. It wasn't really burnable. So they say. Yeah, there was every intention to burn that thing to the ground. And Is it true was the one? Not quite, I, at a certain point, I was like, okay, I've got enough sound. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, if the cops get busted in here, they're going to come busted into a room full of people trying to set the building on fire. And I'm ready to climb back down the ladder myself. So, um, I don't know if this one works. I'm pretty sure they did, because I remember looking through the police reports that um, Gerard had contributed to the, the files in the archives. And, I don't think they want it right away, though. No, I, I mean, I don't know when they happened, but it looked like it was just in specific kind of isolated rooms, but... I remember Peggy Sue and the late great Jason Bishop come running at me, like, I can't remember, but they didn't get hit, but a couple other people did, and we ran into that Star's Fancy Shancy restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and we went in, there's a bunch of freaks and, and, and these actors queers, and there's pepper spray smell everywhere, and the mayor is like, can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> they actually did. They went and got like you know, pictures of water to wash people's eyes out with. All the while, these like you know you know highbrow people are having their, their uh, dinners. They don't even have to they're not even block away until there's lights going on. And they're having their you know their fancy dinners and they're not aware of what's going on outside. Um, my name is Wade Palmer. I was at the well, everybody actually. <laughs> <laughs> Three things I want to point out is that that night we had a history behind us from 1989 where we had peacefully demonstrated and been beaten down by the police just two years earlier. So the organizers of this evening had that in their brain that we were not going to be victims of the police again or ever. I do believe that most people didn't come intending to do anything. They came to express their anger. The anger was ignited. Gasoline got added along each step, so to speak. And um, <laughs> allegedly, um, my leather jacket still has a big burn mark from a police car that went up somehow. How did we do all this without the internet? <laughs> we had no cell phones, we had no email, we had no Facebook, we had, you know, all this stuff just kind of got planned like Lido said at the cafe floor. And, you know, I was thinking like, we love the cafe floor. Um, and I was thinking, like, you know, did we have phone trees? Like, how did phone trees work? You're supposed to call five numbers on the day we call five other numbers. But I don't even remember it being that form. It was really just kind of word of mouth. And you just kind of told your roommates, and they told their friends, and they just, everybody lived in the neighborhood, and everybody kind of worked with each other, and, you know, it was all very much on the fly. And that's kind of amazing to me to look back now and, you know, just think how different things are 20 years later. 
we are a multi-dimensional community now. We don't have this one issue, we have hundreds of issues. Mm -hmm. But we also have very limited leadership beyond the checkbook writing community. And until we see an activist group willing to start putting themselves in the street again and speaking what the people have to say versus what we're told to say, I, I don't think we're going to have any writing anytime soon. But I really want to thank you guys for being on the, on the panel and, and saying the truth. And it was an honor being arrested with you. <laughs> There's a lot that's been going on in just the last week of people being militant, doing direct action, and getting arrested. And I, you know, both in um, starting in New York with the Occupy Wall Street, and today Occupy San Francisco took over a number of banks and people got arrested. So there are including one person who was going to come here because AB 101 was the first big action that he went to and he couldn't come here because he was getting arrested in the oh, Chase Bank I lobby. Know. I know. I was like, that is a good experience. Yeah. 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 So why was this the last time we set the state building on fire? <laughs> right? So the Governor Schwarzenegger vetoed same-sex marriage twice and we didn't try it. The people of California voted against same-sex marriage, and we didn't riot. The courts have made numerous decisions in favor and against. So not that employment non-discrimination is the same as same-sex marriage, but they probably occupy a fairly similar level of sort of attention for the mainstream LGBT movement. The Vito riot was the last queer riot in the United States in the world, as far as we can tell. So worldwide, no one has decided to riot as a queer community. Sense Although so the question goes a little broader. But it's worth pointing out that Los Angeles kept it up for two weeks yes. yeah. after after we did in our state building. They like blocked runway traffic at LAX and all sorts of things. So LA was. Uh, also, you got to remember that, that in LA there's a higher concentration of Republicans. So. A lot of money that went into Pete Wilson's campaign came from Southern California and Southern California queers. So, um, I guess they felt more betrayed. Continue <laughs> 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 right. to write. To just speak my mind, Frank, uh, I don't think the LGBT community is very angry. Yeah. And uh, uh, we're more upper class, we're more established and we're um, and frankly the LGBT vote you can't assume is progressive no. a lot of people were doing the you know the property destruction um, weren't you know the act up types quote unquote you know that it was you know a lot of people who weren't as familiar or maybe jaded you know with you know activism and who were therefore more easily set off to, to cross that boundary. That's that's just my speculation. I also think you know, at the time of Prop 8 passing, people weren't dying anymore. Uh, 20 years ago there were a lot of folks dying and I think that fuels rage and anger. I think people are still dying. I think it is really important, yes. but I think the community has Thank become you. divided. I think like you know, the trans community, which is a community that I'm a part of, has a lot of people that are dying every day. And I think that a lot of people got really super comfortable because, you know, they could get jobs, they could get money, they could be in relationships. You know, especially being somebody who doesn't live here, who comes and visits here, San Francisco is so lucky. You know what I mean? Like, being able to walk around the Castro and see, like, couples together making out, I'm just like, oh my fucking god. But there is still so many kids that are just like unhappy and not okay. And I really wish there was a more, you know, like community where everyone worried about these things and everyone wanted to riot when another kid kills himself or another kid gets beaten because they don't look the way they should look and the way that it's impossible to get employment, health care, to go and see a doctor, to be in relationships, anything. Um, the other part of why people don't riot is you know, it's getting fucking scary 
like I was in London supporting my partner doing like the ed education club stuff. We got killed in for 11 and a half hours in the middle of winter with no food, no water, no doctors, no toilets, no nothing. You know, they basically smashed us into submission to where I don't ever want to demonstrate ever again. You know, like I definitely had PTSD after that. Mm. So that's, you know, two reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian. Yes, I went to Sacramento. I was knocked up for two years. I mean, 88 to 89. Uh, there was the last one I was in, big one, 100,000 against the Iraq war. We looked at that crowd and we thought, oh my God, how are we grown? That's what Ingrid said. It was a huge escalation. We did it. There was no a police car burning. I can't remember that. That was someone I know. But, and then it stopped. And then everyone ignored it. It was a very it was huge hopeful rally of extremely peaceful people that was just ignored. And I, I, I imagine that goes into it. Also, I think because we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have computers, there was a lot more face-to-face -face contact yeah. that people had. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we couldn't just text somebody or send an email to somebody or we could even send an email to someone's phone. I mean, we actually had to meet and congregate. Mm -hmm. And it was it was very, very, you know, I mean, because all of you can attest to it, it was very, it was a very, very different feel. Great. Okay. We're coming to a close in our time, so I wanted to ask Gerard if you have any comments. You've been thinking about this a lot in putting this together. No, my only comment is that I knew that the panel would have great stories I hadn't heard, and I knew that half the panel would be the rest of the people who came back. And hearing all these stories is just so fantastic. Uh, we're talking about, well, we need to get together and talk. It's one of the things that the museum has offered us, is a place to come and talk, to share these stories with each other, and to share them with a generation that wasn't here at the time, or with people who weren't here at the time. It's so empowering for me to see the ways that our history can be used. Uh, it's not a dusty textbook. It's a tool we can use to shape the present and the future. And I think this event is a real, a real indication of that. So I hope all of you will help support the Museum of Historical Society. It's ongoing.